betterment. Uh, this is a solution-driven platform that we uh, that was created so that we can find answers. We have some heated discussions at times, so um, hopefully it's after nine o'clock. So hopefully that your kids are away and you pretty much have some adult conversation tonight. And tonight our topics is the power in sex. No, actually the power of sex, dealing with love and respect. So to start us out, I want to find out what does the power of sex actually mean? So I'm always going to go to my buddy over here, Pastor, Pastor Knotts, the power of sex. What, is, what, what, what does that mean to you? You know, I think if I look at the Bible, um, you know, it, it, sex is not really actually defined. It's that powerful and there's a lot of room for self-definition of it. The only things that we can extrapolate, I think, from the scriptures regarding the subject are, I'd say, like seven things. One is just, I mean, obvious procreation. God gave Adam and Eve the mandate to fill the earth. So they had to procreate to make it happen. The other piece is, is for unity, which is basically bringing couples together. And you got to understand men and women are hardwired different. You know what I mean? Women need to be emotionally connected to feel fulfilled in sex, whereas men feel more connected after sex. But sex is designed to bring you know, a man and a woman together and unify them. The other pieces of it is, is that, you know, like the Bible in Song of Solomon talk about sex as a visual pleasure that God gave us. He says sex is good and, and it's to be enjoyed. It's not just for procreation. There's a physical uh, pleasure that comes with that as well. And, you know, God, if it was about sex and having baby, then desire and passion and pleasure would, you know, would play no role in it. But because God designed it to be pleasurable, it functions and works itself out even in our bodies. The other piece is just sort of a physical and emotional release that we can see in scripture as people will find comfort through sex with each other. And I'll unpack scripturally for you. The other piece is, is sort of like sacrifice and submission. You know what I mean? Like sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with how you feel emotionally as a woman or, you know, how a man, you know, needs to be stimulated sexually. Sometimes it's about sacrifice and submitting to one another because their bodies are not their own, right? They're to mutually give themselves away to each other. And the other piece is, is just, you know, to bring us out of our own comfort zone. Men and women think about sex differently. You know, men are from Venus, women are from Mars, or one of those, you know, it's one of those, I forget what the book is, but, the way we think about sex, yeah. men and women are different. So, so those are some of the, just some of the biblical components of what sex is. But like I said, it, there's a lot of room, a lot of range in it scripturally, and it's not like distilled down to this one specific definition. Yeah, that's how powerful. Yeah. It is. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, a lot. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> so, and that's what we want to do for tonight. We want to start to make some sense about this word sex because you're, we're going to have a lot of thoughts and opinion. And the first thing I was thinking yeah. about when it comes to what you said, I right away thought about um, how you defining it. Because uh, if you look at any other animal, male and female animal, you know, that come together, they have a, a, a need at that particular time and they come together and they have this thing called sex. Um, and I don't know if they got all those feelings and looking to sacrifice for one each, each another and so forth. They feeling they, they got a need. And I guess that's why we talk about the difference between a male and a man. So we're going to get deeper into that, um, Pastor Knott. Uh, I want to just check in on Shalay. I know she's waiting up there to get her little comments in there. Shalay, Professor, yes. how are you? 
I'm doing good. So, um, yes, even though I respect Pastor Knox and everything he said, and, you know, I think I was raised like that. So it's always been a conflict to me. You know, I've even written, written pieces about can you love God and sex? Because, you know, as I got older, it's always been like sex is only with marriage, only with marriage, only with marriage. It was drilled into me. But the truth of the matter is, is that since because I'm a professor, I deal with students and looking at my own life. Um, I've seen sex in two different ways. The first way is that sex to me is a spiritual connection. So no matter what form you're doing it in, the reason you're doing it, I think there is always going to be a soul tie with someone you have sex with. So I'm always conscious of that. Um, and the second thing is I do understand that some people just want to engage in the act of sex, um, meaning that sex for them is just a physical act. It has nothing to do with love. And so, you know, I think there's a balance that um, people, you know, need to take when it comes to sex. I mean, you have women that do like this, uh, talk about like the slut walk of shame, you know, why they can't sexually express themselves the same way men do. So there's a lot of issues when it comes to sex. And I, I guess I have a, draw a thin line when it comes to that, so. Wow, that's crazy. I I, I, I mean, I'm listening, uh, Omar, what's your thoughts on this here? I mean, sorry, Divine, I'll call you Omar because we got we go way back. Divine, what's your thoughts on sex? Like you taught me from way back, words have power. So the first thing we have to do is realign with the words. So for example, the word sex never meant what people say is sex is actually comes from a Latin from sexus, which comes from a root meaning to cut or division. So everyone saying we want to have sex is literally saying I want to divide from you. Let's start there. Where we actually should be using is intercourse, where the original meaning of intercourse actually means to be uh, to uh, is communication between individuals, groups, or countries. So that's where we as a people, because remember, we brought here, we was taught another language and how to accept that language. And then even worse, we really should say, I want to mate with you, and mating or a mate or a shipmate is someone you share your time with. So. I, when people tell me about sex, I'm a little bit confused. I'm like, you want to divide from me? Because sex is used to separate a male from a female. That has nothing to do with interloping or intercourse or, or even lying down with someone. So I feel we have to bring it back to the real problem is we have the wrong definition. Well, so, you know, this is a challenge that we always, you have to, I always taught you about words and words create our world and us defining what words are. And I'm glad you went that deep with that because I really, when I listened to Pastor Knott, right away I thought about man and women as opposed to male and female. Uh, because uh, that's why the show is a male by birth, man by choice. There is a difference between a male and a man and we don't get that correct a lot of times. And there are some behaviors, I think, that uh, Pastor Knox was explaining, like sacrifice and all of those things. But I, I agree with you, Omar. I didn't see it as part of uh, a sexual relationship. I just saw it as these are things that you do when you love someone, you care about someone, and you're willing to sacrifice yourself at the expense of yourself as opposed to someone else. So I, I, I was, I'm glad you came up with that, you know, found that definition because that's what we're looking to do, seek knowledge on here and in hope that we can kind of open this up. So let's just, let's say that your definition is correct, all right? And, and it seeks to divide, separate from, right? Divide, separate from, which means that I got a female, that's one sex, and I got a male, that's another set. And really, the only difference is, is what, their, their, their private parts? Is that well, <laughs> well, private parts, is like, I think there's a lot of differences, more than private parts, you know? Well, I'm not just talking about underarm and stuff. I'm going to be other parts. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, Shalei. What do you Yes. <laughs> It's ironic you guys said that because me and, um, as you know, our director and producer, uh, Kev, we was just watching a show um, that his aunt put us on about law. And there's actually females out there that have the female body part, 
but on a chromosome level and biological level, she has more testosterone than a man. She is a man by definition. So once again, we are confused just because it has a female part does not mean that it's a female. So now, like it says in ISIS or in Egyptian times, you must know thyself. And once again, whether you are a male or a female to come together intercourse does not necessarily mean that I must you know, put my PP inside of you or vice versa. It, it could just be well, you, could say, you could say penis, not no PP. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quarantine time, so these kids are staying up late. So I just. <laughs> it, it doesn't, the fact, the fact is, this is what this word has got us to. We get into yeah. a frenzy, we start saying stuff like private parts and PP now. Someone's going to say PP. Eventually, you know, and, and we're going to talk about it like we should because they got us with this guilt thing on how we should say. Shale, you wanted to say something. I saw you rising up. Yes, because, you know, I do feel like sex is different between men and, men and women. I mean, so there's two ways that I feel. I feel like we as women, we have a vagina because we are um you know the we are we are givers of life but we are receivers when it comes to sex to sexual intercourse right and so i think it, it has so much more of a burden to us even though women are gangster these days and they like uh uh i can you know i'm gonna take you and leave you like the next person you know and they think that they're men but i think there is a difference sexually between a woman having sex and receiving a man than a man giving, you know? Um, and so I, and, and this may be stereotypical, but I do feel like um, that men have the ability to be like, you know what, I just had sex with you and it's, it's less emotional for a man. It's a less, you know, I'm not saying it's less spiritual, right? Because I think that that's a, that's a deception right? That we think it's that the soul ties are not connected because we don't care about somebody or because we don't love them, that that means that there's no soul ties. I think that's a deception. But I, I do think that it's easier for a woman to be, a man to be like, oh, I can just walk away from this because I didn't love you. Where a woman, I feel like she has to purge herself. And so that may sound stereotypical because I am for the free women sexual movement, but I also think that there's consequences for a woman that is not, um, aware of her own spirituality when it comes to sex. So, oh. uh, um, uh, Pastor, I, I just wanted to ask a question. Then why is it that this thing, sex, three-letter word, is so powerful, though? I know what Omar is saying, but trust me, across the board, I've seen people go to jail for this. We, we done seen all kinds of stuff in the name of sex. Why is this is so powerful? I mean, you know, that we, we, we really, it, it really puts us in a spot. What, what's your thoughts? And I'm, I'm kind of curious. Uh, you know, I think when you talk about just sexuality as a whole, you know, it's different from anything else, you know, like drinking or smoking or eating or any of that, because it's, it's an expression of the Imago Dei, which is Latin for the image of God, right? It's core to our identity, you know what I mean? And it's, it's a, it's powerful, you know what I'm saying? So, and powerful in a way that no other act is, you know what I mean? Because, you know, like if you look in the scriptures, it talks about at the end of the day, you know, the picture of, you know, man and woman is the picture of Christ and his bride, you know what I mean? Like this, this relational um, picture of, and not just relational, but a sexual picture of a bride and his bridegroom, right? Or a bridegroom and his bride. And so when we talk about sex, sex is just so much more, you know, so much more powerful because it's, it's about our identity. It's about, you know, something, you know, it was like the only thing that God really defined as good, right? That, that, that action that, sex that we see good. in the scriptures. And so, yeah, absolutely. And pleasurable. You know what and I'm saying? And the best and, thing in the world. The, and, and one some, of the best things in the world. And in some places, like Ecclesiastes, yeah, and, and you know what? In, and in some cases, like in Ecclesiastes, it compares sex to eternity. Like yeah. this longing to be fulfilled through sex has this sort of eternal 
joy and satisfaction that we long for underneath sex that makes sex so powerful. And that's, and the, that's, case. Why God that's created the case against marriage, yeah. though. You know what I'm saying, too? It's because if it's that serious, um, why do we have to just wait till we get married, especially if you love someone? You know, you about well, I'm, hold on, let me just say this. So let me, I'm sorry about that, uh, Cosmic, just real quick. Just so, um, you don't have to wait to get married. Masturbation is a, is a good option. You know, uh, sexual release is a good option. Um, the Bible is pretty radical about sex and about pleasuring yourself. I think what happened to us is, is that we've got this, you know, Judeo-Christian sex ethic that's so, so terrible and so unbiblical. You know, like, we, we, don't, like to talk, we don't like to talk about it um we're, we're prudish about sex and actually the bible celebrates it so to celebrate you know like to celebrate something that god designed for you to enjoy doesn't have to wait till you get married you can experience it as a single person go masturbate oh hey. also come on go ahead omar huh oh, my pastor is that okay to say Yes, it's very much so. I, I love and respect you for that. Also, we must be realized the same weapon they use to bring us together, they use to divide us, it's a duality. Yes, it's, it's very beautiful, so please yourself. But just even in that, there's a right and wrong way. If you're just going to spill or leave your essence in the toilet, then obviously it's a bad way. You're draining yourself. And some cultures called the little death. But if you know how to retain they actually said it's very vital and it, it'll even um, turn back the hands of time. And also once, like you said, marriage, what is that? It, one time we couldn't go to the chapel. We had to jump a broom. It's, it's actually a commitment between two people. So if you feel committed enough, that's a form of marriage for a bad lack of words. We may have to define that word marriage. Well, you yeah, know, let me, I, I would have to, one second, Shale, I just wanted to bring a thought process because I know I, I just, the challenge I have when somebody outside of me uh, give me a wrong or right way that I want to have sex or do sex or whichever way, I don't mind you defining what it is and everything like that, but you're not with me when I'm by myself, nor are you with me when I'm somebody else, my wife and so forth. So I just really feel that I, I run into challenges of, um, uh, someone going into that space with me, but I would read about some of the things and choose some of the things that people say. That's why I've learned over the years on things uh, when it came to sex as well. Uh, but I have to make the final decision about what it is. And I don't, I don't really think my decision is right or wrong. It's just a decision uh, because there's so many things that we can do. Um, and if we overextend ourselves any which way, it could be right or wrong. You know, so I understand that as well. We got a question. Yes. You want to read that question? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, we have a question. The participant said, according to scripture, sexual morality, immorality is the only sin that sins against the own body. So the power of souls attaching is powerful. But why is it so detrimental as well when used the wrong way? Sex when used the wrong way? Yes. And can sex be used the wrong way? How about that? Because I know a lot of people that would be like, <laughs> I don't think sex can be ever used the wrong way, even if it's used just to feel good. See, no, I see I, I'm, I'm just going to tackle that. I'm going to let you come in there, okay? Just a little bit. When you say, again, the wrong way, and I think this is what Omar is going to probably get to, and that is basically there's laws that have set up around sex and that makes it right or wrong now so we got laws that exist right now around sex and it kind of influences and this is what a lot of people are trying to break away from is that wow how you have these laws determine the type of sex or what kind of sex are involved and i know one law of course is um pedophile you know the kids and so forth like that adults doing things that those, those are sexual relationships that are totally against uh, our legal system, moral system, and so forth. But um, I'm going to let uh, Divine chime in on this because the reason why I am, because he gave us a definition tonight. And I wonder 
as we move on, are we going to continue? Are we going to first dispute his de definition? And that's what I want my Facebook Facebook viewers to look at. Are we going to dispute his definition? And anybody that can dispute it, then let's do so. If not, then we can't continue to operate in the manner that we operate about sex, especially if we're finding out the truth of what it really means to me. So I'm I'm one that looking to change. So explain explain uh, answer that question because I know you wanted to get into it, Devon. Well, I, I gotta use you as an example, Coach, because like I said, you helped raise me from 13. And one thing you used to tell me is you got a great shot, but there's a better way to do it. So if you work out, work out, don't stretch. You may not feel the effects of it today, but eventually those muscles will bunch up. It will hurt you. So there's a proper or healthier way to do things to preserve yourself. And when I used to feel the extra soreness, I'm like, damn, I'm listening to coach. I'm a stretch today. I'm, yes, I'm young. I'm healthy. I could just get on a court and play. But eventually, you're going to feel the effects of not preparing to play sports. Same thing with, excuse for me to say this, everything in life. And then another reason why I wanted to say also that um, this word sex is so important to us. Uh, most people don't know, in the 1940s, there's a, a, a psychological doctor by the name of William Wright, and he came up with something called organ energy, and it has to do with electromagnetic fields. I'm not going to get too deep into it, okay. but when he found out the same thing that creates plants coming from a seed to a tree is that same energy. It's in the atmosphere. It's everywhere. So it's our life force. So why, if that's... I mean, me personally, that's the closest representation I can get to the Holy Spirit. Or, you know, it's even in your breath. When you take in energy, your body uh, goes through a process to, to, to absorb this, spirit, this spiritual or what they call organ energy. And that's where the word orgasm comes from. So when you feel that shock through the body, when you, when you orgasm, that's actually organ energy building up between two people and then for better lack of words, exploding or getting to a level where both of you can feel it, which also, um, I wish Dr. Faye Brown was here because the doctor better explain this. Just like Coke or any of these drugs we chase after, it causes a synapsis in our brain. So now our brain says, hey, I can run or I can go and, and do uh, graduate from college, which will take me four years and I'll get that same height of experience or I can lay down with this person and get it in a matter of minutes. So now the brain rewires itself and it becomes addictive because it's a shorter path to your, to your excitement or this, this dopamine release into your bloodstream. So people don't realize there's also a chemical addiction to sex and they confusing it with spiritual or love or even emotional. That's why a lot of people, you'll see, they'll have sex and then when they roll over, look at the person like, oh my God, what did I just do? <laughs> when they come back to their senses. <laughs> see, I, 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 again... We're not talk right now. We spend a lot of time on sex, but we ain't talking about love. We we ain't even really talking about like you might like sex, but we ain't talking about love. We ain't even talking about respect. And and these those things is something that a man and a woman can provide in a relationship. They're the only two animals that can take on that same responsibility because as a female and a male when two or two dogs are on the street and they in heat, there's no love and respect in the middle of that. It's just straight up, we going at it. And um, satisfying that chemical uh, makeup that whatever is taking place in their body. So as we move from sex, I, I would like to move from to love and respect because those are two words that when it come in, those are the things that would decide whether I want to have sex with you or that act of sex. I don't even know what to call it no more. Intercourse? Intercourse. <laughs> what, what are they calling it now? What it, what, it ain't sex no more. What, what you want to call it? It's intercourse still. It's intercourse. Yeah, intercourse. But we must say, I must say, Coach Gustus, it's important that we realize that I think the reason why we didn't bring up love and respect is because we're living in a new generation where people just want to get it off. Like, it's not about love and respect anymore. I mean, listen, when I think about sex, I'm always thinking about, listen, you know, especially at this stage in my life, there should be love and respect there. When it, Even when I think about it, even when I'm lusting in the mind or whatever, I should always think, you know, at this stage, like, 
can I love this person? Do I respect this person? Right. But in this new generation and with, with the people that I see, it is no, it is not like that. There is no, um, basically, uh, what can I say? This, this whole notion of, you know, love and respect, you know what I'm saying? It's like, no, um, I just want to have sex and I don't have to love you. I don't even have to respect you. Okay. Um, and so I think that is the debate today. Uh, according to pastor now, those things that he mentioned, uh, probably, um, those are some of the dynamics of, uh, what, love and respect is i listened to him those are the things that i heard from him that was the love and respect side i didn't see that and I, now there's more even more clarity after the definition that omar had given um that um and then and then of course pastor said that god said that sex was good so uh, omar if he says that god says the sex was good did god not know the definition of sex Oh well, this is what I'm going to say, and, and this is this is going to pretty much sum it up for you. Well, if we realize the is love and respect is a frequency, it's a vibration. Lust is a lower vibration. So if you listen to the music now, that's why when I really love when I really love a girl, I don't play today's music. I want to just you know excuse my French, everyone, f you and run. I play Marvin Gaye. We need sexual healing. I play oldies because it was at a higher vibration. The music now is so low of a vibration, they talk about getting it on in the streets. So we got to realize it's the music or magic that we allow our children to listen to today that you don't really hear love songs like you used to where they, where, you know, they talk about going on long walks together. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. You know, you don't hear men crying on a track anymore. <laughs> now it's, I got money, bitches and hoes, who's my friend? It ain't, you know, I, I want to take you out. I want to be with you the rest of my life. So it changes the vibration. There, you're right. There is no love and respect in intercourse anymore. It's just a game that you play. So, um, Pastor, do we have, can we interject love and respect into uh, what, it, what the young folks are constantly are saying that the culture uh, today is not interested in that and they just basically want to have sex? Where do we, how do we bring that along you, into relationship? You know, there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 11 that says all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. So, yes, you you can have sex without you know, um, inserting love or respect. It could just be a jump off. But you got to understand, it does have a consequence that comes with it. You know, everything in life has a consequence, right? Like, like I can eat whatever I want, but there's a consequence for eating whatever I want. You know what I'm saying? Like, like um, you know, if, if you're going to practice, you know, if you're going to have sex uh, and, and it's random and assume that there's not going to be any kind of emotional connection to it. Uh, you kidding yourself, or any kind of soulish connection to it. You kidding yourself. So, but I also want to say, you know, like when we talk about lust, I think we have a faulty definition of lust, especially Bible thumpers. Literally, lust in the Greek means covetousness. So it's not saying anything about like a man walks in the room, sees a beautiful woman, and he gets sexual energy or he gets turned on. But that's not lust. Right, lust is covetous. It's when you are trying to act out and trying to hit that, right, outside of God's biblical design. So if I'm married and I walk into another room and see another woman and I lust in the biblical sense, which means I covet that. Now I'm trying to sneak, trying to have an affair with that woman outside of the bounds of my marital commitment to my wife. That's what biblical lust is. I think what we think is, is if we get turned on, that's what lust is. Uh, God designed sexual energy you know what i'm saying and uh and god is glorified through that sexual energy because he created it but i do think at the like i said at the end of the day you know love and respect are are super important if you really want to have a relationship and you want to have a healthy relationship um that's going to go to distance like those are super important and a, a, a very important dynamic to a relationship that men need to love their wives the way Christ loved the church and laid his life down for it because that's not 
uh, innate to men, right? So to lay down your life for your woman and to love her, not based upon how she's reacting in the moment, is crucial to the relationship. But at the same time, men don't necessarily need love as much as they need respect, right? They want to feel like they your dude. And respecting them on that level is important to filling them up and speaking to their masculinity or their manhood. Now that brings me to another question. That was a good point because uh, so the question is is basically um, women take on a lot of responsibilities when it comes to sex these days, and especially when it comes to yeah. um, you know there's a lot of deception in sex, right? So people are being deceived to thinking, okay, you love me, you know, and you respect me, and they're using sex as a as a ploy sometimes. But what is the man's responsibility when it comes to sex? Because it seems like more and more women are, you know, taking the, on that burden. Well, one of the things that I tell young men all the time is we carry a seed, we are to protect that seed. So, you know, you're, you're trying to get people to delay getting into some trouble as much as they can, especially when you're having babies and you can't afford it and so forth like that. So I always tell them, protect your seed. So this is uncommon young, against men, uh, especially young boys growing up and they feel in the kind of way, but I let them know that that saying where I don't need a man, uh, I could do bad by myself and all of those nice sayings. And I try to teach young men that you have the seed, you carry the seed and you bring life and you, have, you should have the right to protect that and don't seek to give it to anybody. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of men, women really believe that uh, no matter what, they can get a man to have sex with them. And I try to teach them, yo, this is the level of discipline that you're gonna have to have. Because the bottom line is, as long as they feel that way, you're giving away your seed. That woman can take that seed and basically, you know, do whatever she wants with it. Um, uh, she's gonna get pregnant and have your child. And now you have all kinds of confusion for the child and everything. So don't be in a rush to give your seed away. So I know back in the days, everybody said, don't be in a way to, in a rush to give the cookies away. And um, now I'm teaching young men, and I have been over the last 30 years, is don't be giving your seed away. You know, hold on to that seed, you know? Can I say something, Coach? Can I can I can I insert some? So when it when the Bible talks about the husband is to love his wife, Christ loved the church. That word, there's three definitions of love, right? There's erotic love, which is sexual love. There's filial love, which we get the word friendship love, and then there's agape, which is unconditional. When Paul talks about love, he's talking about unconditional love. It's not predicated upon how your wife is responding to you, right? It's 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 actually can be hazardous to your health in a good way because you're loving her sometimes in spite of herself, right? You're laying down your life. Um, and it ain't based upon how you feel that day. Not every day it, am I sexually drawn to my wife. You know what I said? But I love her and I'm committed to her. And uh, I plan to, to walk with her until our last breath. So when we talk about a man's commitment of love, we're not talking about commitment to to sex, but sex is a, is a big piece of that. And it's not even a commitment to friendship, though friendship is a big piece of it. The undermining thing, that foundation that drives that relationship is an unconditional commitment that man has for that woman, right? And he lays his life down for her. Interesting. I just wanna to say too, um, uh, is that, um, that it's important to notice that I think the pop people problem that people have with the church and problems that I have had with the church is that first of all, like you said, Pastor Knox, the church is set so taboo about sex. Nobody wants to talk about sex. It's almost like a nasty word, like a nasty thing. Like, you know, so I think it, you know, has this like rebellious type of nature that's, a, that's like attached to it because people who were raised in religious forms, not just the church, but any religious like form, 
um, is taught that sex is, you know, only for marriage and it's supposed to be this great thing. And then when you, you have sex, you're like, oh, this feels good. It's great, but it's only for marriage. What? And then you have people like in the last couple of years, I have so many pastors that I know and people in the church. And then I, I ask them, well, did you have sex before you got married? Yeah, but you shouldn't do it. You know? And I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> like, um, you know, that's not fair. You know what I'm saying? And then I'm thinking about myself, just being honest, a woman who's had sex before was married, you know, and had sex in that marriage, then went through a divorce. It was like a shock to my body. Like, what? Like, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? I'm used to having sex. And now I'm at this place where, you know, I'm supposed to now just not have sex and wait maybe 10 years or seven years until I find somebody else. And even though I know I'll have this feeling, no. For me, it's when I find somebody that I love, that I can share that energy with, I want to share it with them because I know how beautiful it is. I know how good it is. So I think that's where the church and sex and not just the church, religious institutions, period, and sex like often clash. Well, you got to be careful about in love and to love. I always teach about that. In love is usually when you fall in love. I'm in love. And that's when y'all get married. And you're in love because you this desire to have this sex. So then you fall out of love. You're no longer in love. And basically, um, you now have to rely on to love, which is what Pastor was talking about. It is to love her. That's an action where I'm going to love her unconditional. I'm going to love him unconditionally, regardless of the sex, regardless of all the other things that got me in love with that person, because I'm no longer in love with him. And, you know, you know, being married for 40 years, what I've learned is I always break it up in percentage. And, you know, uh, me and my wife, when we was madly in love, and then you got another level in love. But then when it became a point where I had just two love, regardless because that is the vows that you take and it ain't based on i'm in love with this man it should be based on i am to love this man to death do me part or love this man until death all his women to death do us part so it's so important for us to really really grab a hold to that because we really confuse this, these three different loves so i'm glad you mentioned about that pastor because there are different loves that we that we have and in a different levels all right omar before i mean divine before i get to you i think someone have a create a question i want to get through um with the participants all right yes we do have a question the question is is it wrong to withhold intercourse from your marriage partner absolutely absolutely um there's a scripture in First Corinthians, I think, 11, that it talks about when, when you're married, like husbands, your, your body is not your own. It's your wife's and vice versa. Wives, your body is not your own. And, uh, and actually, it says the only time you can deprive your husband is if you both have or deprive your spouse is if you both have a conversation around it just so that you can fast for a particular season. And it needs to be a certain amount of days uh ascribed to that so yeah like you have no right at least biblically to withhold sex from your spouse and it's not based upon well you know if we had a better emotional connection and then that's where that's where being submitted to one another and committed to one another sometimes that ain't at play in the relationship yeah so yeah, that, that sounds nice. That's a nice recipe. But obviously, that's not going on in relationship. Um, but that scripture there, if that was, if everyone paid attention to that and actually did that, wow, a lot of marriage are broken up because uh, somebody is deciding that they no longer want to have sex with that or make love with that person uh, because they ain't not in love anymore. So when you're not in love with, you know, you're going to separate. And then eventually it's going to lead to divorce because something else is going to happen, you know. Um, so it, it, that, and then, you know, what happens if someone gets ill and they can't have sex or they, there's a challenge on the sex side? What do you do with that as well, you know, as 
the other partner. Because I know they have laws that says if you don't have sex for X amount of years or something like that there, you, you actually could get a divorce uncontested. Separate. You know, or separated and so forth like that there. So that unconditioning, is that in, is that in the scriptures as well, Pastor? No, I, I think it, it, outside of adultery and your wife abandoning, I mean your wife, your spouse abandoning you, those are only the grounds for divorce. So we can get into another subject though, which is, is you know, like we could talk about polygamy and what yeah. the Bible has to say about it, because I think it was practiced in the early church. And that's, you know, according to our own sort of pure puritanical Jewish Judeo-Christian ethic, uh, a lot of our monogamy is really socially conditioned. I think the scripture makes a bigger case for polygamy than mon monogamy. And I know that sounds strange coming from a pastor, but I can walk you through the scriptures if you really want to. You know, well, you look at the Mosaic law, huh? Yeah, you so know. So there's, there's ways to get fulfilled. Uh, yeah, because you know I, I I watch my man. I don't practice it, but there is the, that I know was that, a practice, standard practice in the early church. One of my young, that or not. One of my young, it, you intelligent, want one of my young intelligent guys from Brownsville come on, and he, I think uh, brother polite, and uh, he has like three wives, uh, and he has a whole formula that he has to have those three wives. And I don't, I don't think he cheat as much as the people that maybe be in the church cheating on their wives and on the outside because he got three of them already. And so that's the whole thing. Hey, Divine, I'm sorry, that I got to get to you. Go ahead, buddy. Hi. Uh, well, actually, I wanted to um, put um, Eric Knox and Shalee's point together because Shalee used a very important word. And that's why I, I don't believe in social distancing but I definitely believe in cultural distancing. So that word institution, mm -hmm. most people don't realize institutionalized church is no different than institutionalized crazy house. When we hear that word institution, that means you're, you're being forced to believe away. And just like um, Pastor Knox said, in the original days, there was a lot more spiritual freedom. And even better, he said there's m money in sex. So there's more money in having people frustrated, confused, um, you know, I don't know if I want to get with you someone buy condoms and this and that because they just want to do it. And it makes so much money off the TV, the commercials, uh, clothes by selling the, let's just say the uh, derogatory form of sex. But once again, intercourse can be a very beautiful thing if, if like you said, there's unconditional love there, if there was a, a responsibility or a respect. Because even... Um, Coach, you teach us that. Uh, even with our own parents, a lot of says, I love you, Pa, but how much say I love and respect you? Because you might love and go out there and do disrespectful things. And when your parent catch you crying, like, why, why are you crying? You, you don't respect me? No, but I love you. But no, we need, we need to start honoring each other as a people like we used to back in the day. You know, in some cultures, you know, it was a very strict uh, punishment for disrespect of your partner or friendship and not love, because love, like you said, it can come and it can go, it's an energy. You know what I'm saying? Everything has a duality to it, like the river, water can go and it can come, you know? So, and also what, back to what he was saying about not having sex with your partner, the reason why scientifically it, it's unfair is because when, that's why, you know, my mom, she used to always warn me, like, don't lay, in, even if y'all friends, don't lay in the same bed, you know, try not to hang over a house too much. Because there's an energy buildup there. It's like magnets. It's just going to pull closer and closer. And the more someone starves you out, you're going to look for that food somewhere else. And that person is pissed off. Like, why are you already chasing this woman, that woman? Because you got an itch. And like I, I was saying previously to my partner, when I was growing up, the only reason why, you know, I'm not to be cocky, but, you know, I was on the basketball team. I was a very uh, popular guy. But I lost my virginity late. And it's kind of my mom who kind of talked me into losing my virginity because I was afraid. 
I'm like, Ma, what is this virginity thing that I can't see, can't hold, can't touch, but they want it so badly? Like, what is this thing? You're not going to sneak me. <laughs> when I, you tell me what that is, Ma, I'm going to lose my virginity. She said, son, are you gay? I said, no. She said, well, you better go and have sex with that girl before she leaves. And it took for me to get older to realize that once I did have that first time, it opened up a hunger in me. Now I, I want it more every day. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at females differently. It, like, like I always tell my younger brothers, there's nothing wrong with uh, looking at a flower, but do you have to pick it? Because after you pick it, it will die if you don't do what? Keep feeding it, keep giving it what it needs. Now it's your responsibility. So I, I advise you just enjoy that flower from afar. And that's why some of the most beautiful flowers have what? Thorns. And mother nature didn't do that by accident because she, she knew how a man think it. <laughs> so um, as, as, and that back to that respect, it's not always, respect starts first, like you told us, with ourselves. The more you respect yourselves, and that's why I want to get back to what Shalei was saying is yes, that is very huge stereotypical. The difference between a man and a woman is y'all are in tune with your emotions from Jump Street. So you don't have no problem showing it. But trust me, when you leave that man, he'd be in that room crying, you don't want his buddies to see it, whatever, but he ain't been broke and can't eat, can't go to work, can't function properly. It's just be probably better at hiding it or we're not uncomfortable sharing it with each other. But, wait, um, wait, wait, wait. Devon, are you trying to say that when you leave a man, even if he don't love or respect you, he crying? Because I doubt that. Cry comes in many different forms. Sometimes cry comes in self-deprivation. Sometimes when a man leaves a woman, then he goes after her. He'll, he'll be you know, honest. Okay. You know, you're my brother, but I just can't see that. I think that men uh, have... Uh, a, I'm only speaking because <laughs> even I... And I, I think uh, men have... A, maybe maybe you're just more in tune with your spiritual side, so you feel that way. But I think that there are brothers out there that they have no connection, period. Like, there is, like, nah, sis, bye. Matter of fact, I got her over there, and I love her. You know, um, uh, you know, so I think that we need to clear that up. The, 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 the thing is, you never get the chance to hear, damn, I shan't have left, shorty. Damn, you, you get on my, I, I was better off with the, you, you never get to hear that conversation. Maybe, bro, maybe, bro, but there's some people, listen, maybe, but I'm going to tell you, there's some, I, because I'm a girl who has a lot of guy friends, okay, <laughs> I hear, I, they tell me the truth, okay, for, for some crazy reason, okay, and I hear it, like, yeah, Shale, I love all of them, but I don't love them the way I like, I love her, and of course, they use in love, sperm, baby, I wanted to say one thing about respect, too, respect is needed, because I will say, say this, I think that it's, it's important to say that a lot of guys will feel like they can have emotions for different people, right? But it's that one person they love and respect that mm. gets all the, the, the prize, that gets the prize. Because I'm even thinking about a woman like myself. I've been in good relationships, bad relationships, you know? So, and, and in those relationships that I allowed myself not to be honored, let me just say that, I allowed myself not to be honored, um, I noticed that, you know, it was a lack of respect that I put on the relationship, right? I didn't, I didn't um, make them respect me as a woman. So I think respect is so important. And even in a marriage, when I think it's a hard thing, it's easy to say, yes, you can't withhold for your husband. But if your husband or your wife is out there sleeping around, not respecting you, that's where you, be, you begin to think, I, I have the right. Wife. That's not your husband or your wife, if that's hey, the way Shalane, you know. um, what are, what, are, what, what, are the, what are the what are the what are the uh, Facebook people saying? Can we see that? Are they? I see they. I see we have a lot of chats there. What are they saying? Unmute. Unmute. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have the chats. So you can go and see. But a lot of people. I know a lot of people said that love and lust is different. And Pastor Knox talked about that. So that was a good comment. Um, and you know, people are saying different things in the chat. But let me look and see. I see some comments right here. So. Oh. I think can't hear you, um, they, I? oh yeah here we go we're talking they're talking about uh, a lot of people saying there's different cultural interpretations too yes taking consideration so culturally people may see it different that's important maybe we should talk about that for the next couple of minutes um they say and yes a comment that is that kingdoms have gone to war over a woman so i do believe that yes that's true yes wait uh but once again, generally speaking, to answer that kingdoms, kingdoms also been ran by women. So if, if the woman's running a war, she went over, uh, 
if y'all look up Nefertiti, she got her eye plucked out for standing by her man. That's where the word Pharaoh got passed to males. Pharaoh is actually a feminine word. So that's where, uh, once again, I try to keep it universal. If you have an STD and you sleep with me, I get burned too, because I take some of you in me. We're both built the same, but separate uh, and, and different uh, edges of how you say the duality. So don't ever believe, just because he may not realize how he's been burnt by doing you dirty, doesn't mean that he haven't been burnt. And a lot of these men, trust me, I know, I know women out here that get money from everybody. She use him for tampons, use him to pay the bills, so on and so on, but she'll bring it back to this one geek dude that all those men wonder, why do you, why you rock with him so much? And it's because she feels that love and respect from him. And we, that is out of order. Her. Let me just say that is out of order, okay? <laughs> I, I, I'm just joking, I'm just joking, but men do the same thing. We, we, that's what I'm trying to show, I'm trying to show you the universal law, because that's what, that's my whole thing with the, uh, how do you say the, um, institutionalization is that when a man do something or a woman do something is out of order. No, out of order is out of order for both of us. And if you look in the ancient scriptures, man and woman is no different. I don't believe this man from no, Mars. No, no. I must say, let me just disagree with you there, okay? Men have a responsibility, okay, to be the leaders. I don't care. And, and, yeah, I, that's the way I believe. I know you don't believe it because I'm such a strong woman, but, you know, for the most part, I do believe that Kingdoms fall with men's decisions. Now, maybe a woman has re led a nation, and that's fine. I'm not. I'm for women pastors. I'm for women leaders. I'm a woman, so I'm all pro women. But I'm saying that men. It, the problem is, even in a black community, is because men have not been head of their homes because they have not taken the charge that they need to charge in their homes and they're sleeping with people of having home. sex, making babies, and not taking the responsibility of love and respect with those children. So that's part of the reason but, why the black family is deteriorating right now because of black men. No, it's because we mm. listen to white people. That's not because of black <laughs> men. First and foremost, a black man is not even allowed to be in a home. If we go back to tribal times, you know when the men leave the home to go get food? No, stuff? don't talk about tribal times. In tribal times, men were responsible for everything. Everything. Women didn't even have a place. That's not true. That's not, I don't know which you listen they to. They had truth that they had a place as elders, some of them, but they did not have a place as far as the decision makers. The main decision makers. The most powerful country on this planet, which is London, is still a monarchy, sis. You can't say that. Look up Nubia. Women been at the head of the household longer than, and you listen to Caucasians? Stop that. That's institutionalization. First no, trust foremost, me, too. I'm not institutionalized. This is my personal All right. belief. All right. See? This is my See, personal sure. belief. I believe, I listen, I've studied it, okay? As a, pro, as a feminist, not crazy feminist, but a feminist, I've studied it. I saw what a black family broke down because of men. So this is my cultural belief as men. The attack on men, the attack on black men, that's what it was. They invented the gun because they couldn't deal with us because we were just to back up our black women. But when they brought out the gun and drugs and liquor, yes, the man fell, but it's who, who keeps a man feeling strong? Not another man, it's a woman. So much so that you don't even understand what female is. Female is a two-part word that when you really look at it, break it down, it means iron man. Yeah, you didn't know that. Fee, F-E, that's on a periodic table, iron. You know what? That sounds confused? all great, Devon. You know why? Because I'm all I'm for a woman an iron man. But I'm also, yeah. for, you know what I'm saying, believing that if we don't put men as head of the homes, and we don't have our rightful place. This is just my belief. I'm not saying that a woman can't have a home and raise a great man. I'm a single mother, so of course I believe that, right? But I'm also saying that we need to also have uh, have men have be at a certain place or it deteriorates everything. These movements that I'm seeing no, is because movements, I'm telling you, movements that are going the wrong way because families are being destroyed. And it's, it, So let, it, me just, let me just say something to both of you guys is, uh, First, we have to define what the head of the household means. And of course, in our culture here, we define it as the breadwinner, the person that brings home the bread, and men even define it that way. And one of the ways that you can destroy a man is not to have, give him the opportunity to do what he does best, which is work, which is perform, which is do all of those things. So it sounds very logical if I was any way trying to destroy a black man, 
in this country, my goal is to make sure that he can't do either one of those things. I, I don't, you guys remember, um, you guys saw Roots? Yeah, Roots, you saw Roots, right? So in Roots, there was a major part in Roots that I always stick in my mind. And it was when Kuta Kinte was hanging on the, on the, on the, on the, on the back of the thing and, the, and the, he had a slave master was standing next to another black man whipping him, trying to get him to change his name to Toby. To me, that was the, that's when it signified that you will no longer be the head of your household, regardless of whatever you try to do. That woman, we're gonna make sure she's the head of the household. We're gonna make sure that she protects you so much that you won't even think about trying to be the head of the household because we're gonna let her see this in her mind. So that's why when little boys are growing up, the mother raised, raised the daughter, but loved the son. And they keep the son docile. You don't even want him said because you're afraid from him. You don't want what you're seeing now where people are getting shot and so forth. So our daughter, our parents, especially the woman, she keeps her son right close to her. So he grows up thinking that this is the position that he has to take. No one is gonna be above his mother, you know, including another man now. And then don't let her get into any scraps. So we have to be very careful about, especially as we go into this generation, we gotta be careful about defining what a man is and the leader of the home is. So can a man stay home with the kids and you go out and work since they're, we know that you're gonna get the job quicker than he is? Uh, uh, stay on home and, work and still be the man or the king in the home in the eyes of the women that's the question that we should be asking our women because if it can't then uh, he's home he's taking care of the kids he's, he, he's probably trying to do some business or something like that there and you're going out and you're making 150,000 a year and you bring in all the, the cash and stuff because you got the education, getting ready to be a doctor and stuff like that. And so you- Don't talk about me, Coach Gustis, okay? <laughs> Let me just say, okay, I, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm flexible with that because I always give a man his place, no matter, it's not about the, the money he brings in his pockets, it's more but about the character. Let me ask you something, could, could you personally take on a, um, like a janitor or something like that there? I don't think so, I tried. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. So what happens is you said I don't that know. He, he could, it depends, but I, I don't think so. Okay, but you said it before, before you knew who that janitor is. That janitor could be Omar, and he don't have the same traditional education, but he may. That's be true. Honest. I mean, let me just say, Coach Gustis, I, I was gonna take on someone who was actually a janitor because I knew him and I knew his history, and I liked him, and he was a cool guy, but. Trust me, I've I've tried. If if someone is not culturally diverse for me, at this it's part of my life, and you know, it's certain things they gotta have. It's not about the education level. It's not even about their job. It's more about me having somebody who who is like we talked about last week, uh, equally yoked in all ways. And I I've tried, and I've just not. It has to be a synergy for me. And sometimes I find that when I date certain people, saying, "Oh, they're good guys with a nice heart," you know, I'm like bored out of my mind, you know. And so I think that that brings us back to to love and sex. And when you're thinking about that too, and respect, you know, how can you, you know, at, you know, as a woman, um, you know, especially as a woman and a woman of uh, emotional and spiritual, it has to be a full circle for me. You know what I'm saying? Love, sex, and respect, and. And it makes it better. Like, yes, I'll have sex with you, but if I love and respect you, the sex is going to be even better, you know? <laughs> so, okay. so Pastor, you, you think about this head of the household type situation. Um, I, you know, I hear what Shalay is saying, and, and you know, and um, I know in our generation, we were taught that, especially mine. Um, and I try to sustain that. I, that was, that's always been my goal is to be the head of my household and treat my, my wife like a queen and all the other, and I'm the king and the whole thing. But these women are not having that now. So, you know, what, what, how do you, how do you um, reconcile that in the, in the, in the I, I, you know, you know, look, I, I'm married to a very strong black woman, very strong. And, uh, you know, like if I look at the scriptures, you know, part of the curse after Adam and Eve partake, partook of the fruit, 
God threw him out the garden and he pronounced a curse over him. And the curse was different from the man. He would, he would work, but he wouldn't find fulfillment in his work. And for women, uh, the curse was that they would try and usurp the authority of the man. You know what I'm saying? From him serving in his rightful place in the home as the head of it. You see what happens to a nation when the men are exterminated. You look in, you know, in the book of Exodus, what does Pharaoh do? He tries to take out the men when Jesus comes, right? What does the king of the breakover woman world do? He says, go find all the boys two years and younger and take them out, right? There's something powerful about taking young boys out and attacking the male of any culture, right? So, you know, when I think about like my wife and I, you know, like I, I am the head of the house but we mutually submit, but we don't submit the same way. You see what I'm saying? And so, you know, if we're making massive decisions on like, you know, like when our kids were young about going to school or what neighborhood or what city we were moving to, it was a lot of dialogue that we had together, a couple. But somebody has to have the tie-breaking authority to say, hey, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're at an impasse, but a decision has to be made. And I think that's where the man has to step up as the head of the household and break the tie. I know that doesn't fit today in our No, I agree with that, but I must say that sometimes the woman is just better at it. It just depends. Like, I'm going to let the man break the tie, but, but if you know I'm better at finances and you not that good at finances, let me win this because I'm better. You know, <laughs> that's it. You know what? What? It, it, yeah, it and really it comes down to, you know, like what hills you ready to die on. Like my wife makes a lot of decisions in my home, um, and I, I can think I can count on on a couple of my fingers that that I had to say, nah, this is what we, one was moving to Portland um, during the housing market crisis. My wife hated Portland. This is our second stint here. And uh, she didn't want to move back here. It's too white. In fact, USA Today says Portland is the whitest city in America. She's like, I don't want my black babies in that white city. But I had to step up and make a decision. And I'm glad I did because it opened up for us when we moved here and got us out of an economic bind that we were in during that housing market crisis between 2008 and 2012. See what I'm saying? So, you know, we ain't making decisions on buying a car or I'm not breaking ties on how she decorates the house or you know what I'm saying um yeah yeah but that yeah. but there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of and that's not even to say that a woman can't even influence a man right their decision she know how to influence if she know how to do it right she know how right. to influence them <laughs> there you go <laughs> look sex. that brings us back sex. to sex okay um, <laughs> um but I want to say also <laughs> That we got a question about mono, mono, um, polygamy because boy, that maybe we can end with this. Um, and yeah. the question was, do men cheat because of the spirit of polygamy? Um, Doctor Pastor Knox talked about polygamy being a big thing, and um, it's more of a case for the Bible. And I've read the Bible, so I do think polygamy is one of those things. That, even though I would never ever go for it, like no way, I'm not sharing my man with nobody. No, thank you. Okay, right. and I don't even want to think about him being with somebody else. And it just didn't fit right with me, but maybe because that's my um, psychology, right? That's in my head. Um, but what do you guys think about polygamy? Uh, well, I'll give you my thought, my closing thoughts. I think men are why, like are polygynous by nature. Um, right. They are like they need variety, uh, and they think about sex and women all day, oh, every so day. So us women don't need variety. That what we just like, well, you know. Well, no, I'm not saying you don't, but what I'm saying is, uh, like, for instance, man's testosterone is 10 times more than a female's, right? So, um, and that's, I mean, that's just scientific. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to test that theory because, you know, I know that I've some I'm saying there are some exceptions more than other people have, so I And I'm not know. saying there aren't, ex look, I'm not saying there isn't um, exceptions to that rule at all, but generally speaking, Men are dogs, period. And I think what we've done is beat up men for their lust because we have an improper, faulty definition of lust. And uh, 
the way men are, their circuitry and their biology and how they're wired, um, that, that's how they're, excuse me, that's how they're wired. My, can you guys see me? Yeah. My, All right, so my we're going to move on. To oh, oh, move on. Yeah. Uh, uh, Divine, uh, what, what are your final words on this here? My final words is, um, man is born most time devoid of nature. Woman is in tune with nature so much that every month she's reminded. So let's take it back to where we come from. We come from, uh, uh, let's say, a Nubian or African culture. The male line, you know how long I've been told the male line doesn't do nothing. The, the, the women do all the hunting, but why is it when she brings that to hunt, she makes sure he gets the best part of the meat out of respect because of that image. We're at war. If we was in a, in our own country, our own place, I get everything essentially. But right now, you have to protect the image of a black man above and beyond whatever institutions tell you, whatever what you call it tell you. So we need you to be at the head of the household because like Coach says, we're under attack. I haven't seen every year a woman being slayed by a cop. To be honest, I don't see women face down with their knee on their neck. I don't see that. So I'm looking for my counterpart, my road dog, my, my Marcus and Amy Garvey to have my back. So it's not about right now, head of household and all that stuff. That's not even our conversation. We live right. tribal. If I can do, the next man do it. You know what I'm saying? There's another brother that can hunt. I can probably weave baskets better than everybody else. So I sit home and weave baskets. But we're not in our natural environment, sis. So we're begging you to step up, hold us down while we duck. <laughs> or uh, it's safer for us to be at home with the children. It's just we're adapting to a culture that is anti-us. That's nothing more, nothing less. That's what I want to close with, sis. We need yeah. you. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's so interesting. And Shale, I'm going to do my final say. And I, I, I hear everybody, and, and, and this was a fantastic conversation. Um, Definitely can't have it two ways, you know. At one point, you say, well, you know, my man, he can't go out and tuck nobody. He all of me. And then when what's the, when Eric passed the uh, nod said something about men having, they just dogs. You're like, what? We can't be dogs? You know, uh, yes, you can. But you can't have that man by yourself if you're going to be a dog. Everybody going to play the game. Um, I think that, uh, and women are moving up in that fashion. I, I also really understand what Omar uh, uh, Divine is saying. Uh, we have a situation here. We have to come to grip. We can't use the definitions that we've been, the narrative and the definition define our culture right now. Because we're a hurting culture right now. And we, are, we could sit down and talk about all the things they've done. So what we have to do as men and women, that janitor, if he's a, I had a one, a lady, a, a school teacher, and she was a, she had all her degrees, masters and everything, and she was married to a janitor, and she laid it out. She went to college, to all black school college, and they taught her how to be a wife to a black man in this country. They taught her that. My wife, who went to Bennett College, they taught her one of the lessons in that college was how to love. A black man in this country, not not in Africa, not in uh, Europe, anyway, in America. How do I love this black man here? Because she doesn't. Is no one else in this country that goes that has to grow through the stuff that we grow through now, and hopefully we are growing. But she had to learn how to love this black man because I come on with a whole new set of rules, whole new set of stress, whole new set of everything that no one else has to deal with, including my white friends. And we talk about this all the time. So yes, you, the young people, y'all have to figure this out. And hopefully we can help you figure it out because there's no reason why we shouldn't have two powerful people coming together to battle this here whole life that y'all have to deal with, which I'm talking about y'all involved and into. So once again, whew, this is this, this could get deeper and deeper, you know, and now I'm understanding that next week, next Friday night, right here again, we are actually gonna have a conversation about what's going, that's trending in the world right now. And right now we would think it would be the coronavirus, but, Seems like we got to erase 
racist virus. You know, it's like, what in the heck is going on? And um, this is not something that's just happening overnight uh, with our young uh, and young, I don't even know if that young, the guy that uh, Floyd got was killed, uh, was he young or not? But the point is that what is going on between the police and our black community? What's happening there? And I, I, I know we have some interesting story. We're gonna to try to get some folks on here as well that can give us the side of the police and the side of um, uh, black, particularly black men. And um, why we having this clash that's going on because as much as we are dying from the coronavirus and the numbers went down here in New York, it's like 61 um, that has been in the hospital with this coronavirus. So that's going down and the killing of our young black men is going up. So that's going to be an interesting conversation next week uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern time and 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And so tonight, I want to thank everybody that joined us on Facebook Live. Appreciate you coming through. Um, this was definitely an open conversation for uh, dippings of opinions and thoughts and ideas. I had to learn something at my rightful age tonight. And that's what I try to say to my generation. Hopefully we could sit among our young people and learn from them. I learned from Shalay and, and um, Omar tonight uh, in terms of some of the things that they were speaking. And, uh, and we want to hear your comments too on Facebook Live too. So we'll take questions from Facebook Live next week. Okay. So tune in. Y'all notice how I could change my voice, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shalai. Yes. All right. So this is Coach Gustus from Melba Burke, Man by Choice, executive producer. Mr. Um, thank you to our director and one that watches over us with keen eyes, and that's Nicole Richardson. And of course, our producer, uh, Mr. Kevin, Kev Connect Logan from One Dress Sports and Entertainment. Again, good night. Everybody have a safe night. Be careful out there. And God bless you. And peace. This is Coach Gustus.